You know, every now and again in an interview with an artist, a story is told to me that is so unique, so poignant, so heartfelt, that the story enhances the song to an unparalleled level. And it seems to deepen with every listen after that. Most people thought that this massive hit coming up was an homage by an artist, poetic license on steroids. But we're gonna find out in this exclusive interview that every part of this song actually happened. A struggling singer-songwriter was trying to find that one hit that would get him his first big break. And he found it in one weekend. The story from a Grammy-winning artist who took the world by storm, including a version just recently that put it back in the limelight. The interview's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to hit the subscribe button below to be a part of a community dedicated to the timeless music of the rock era. And look us up on Patreon to be a part of curating this golden age of rock and roll. You know, I say it often on here, the term one hit wonder is really complex because it doesn't capture a band or their song or their career universally. I mean, no one would ever call Jimi Hendrix or Frank Zappa or Lou Reed one hit wonders or Bob Marley a no hit wonder. Yeah, that's right. Bob Marley never charted a top 40 hit in the U.S. I think as a culture, we're fascinated when an artist had that one big hit that moved the world because we're shocked that maybe they couldn't follow it up because it was such a great song. So that's why we call them Bottle Lightning on here, because it takes into account the song and why it moved the world so. In our latest edition of Bottle Lightning, we break down one of the most beloved songs of all time, a song so compelling, it puts us in a trance whenever it comes on, at least it does for me. It's so magical that most people thought that the singer-songwriter behind it just made it up. Mark Cohn was trying to find his breakthrough hit, and he took a trip to Memphis, and what unfolded was almost like a fairy tale of epic proportions. It was a gift. Mark Cohn is one of those amazing songwriters whose catalog is so great, we're just left scratching our heads at how his other songs weren't massive on the charts. Um, his entire debut album, it's perfect. It's chock full of great songs from Dig Down Deep, my personal favorite of his. It's actually my wife and I's song. Baby, let's dig down, dig. True Companion, one of the greatest love songs of all time. I'm asking you to be my true companion. And Silver Thunderbird. How the three of these songs didn't swarm the charts, it's just, it's crazy to me. He's got a silver thunderbird. The song that did go to number 13 on the Hot 100 and was nominated for Song of the Year in 1990 was Walking in Memphis. Feet off a beam, walking in Memphis. A song that is as beloved today as it was when it was released. It was covered last year on Saturday Night Live by Pete Davidson with a guest appearance by Cohen himself as Walking in Staten as a, an homage to the bagel joints and pizza places in his native borough while sporting an I Love Staten Island shirt. It took the song back to the public here and, uh, and gained a lot of plays from there. I've heard thousands of song stories from artists since I started doing this. For me, this is top five. It's a story for the times we're in right now because it'll just lift your spirits. It's a kind of inspiring story that proves that there are bigger things at work here and that hope is never lost. Make sure to let us know of your memories of this song and how this song or other songs have changed your life below. Let's have a great discussion. The time I spent with Mark Cohn discussing this classic composition and his other songs it's just incredibly enlightening, and I'm excited to share it with you here. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Do yourself a favor. Get yourself a new pair of glasses or sunglasses at zenny.com. Shop according to the shape of your face. You can ensure that you always have a variety of really cool, distinctive eyewear that will look great on you. Here is Mark Cohen with the story of Walking in Memphis. Put on my blue suede shoes and I Boarded the plane. This record coming out in 91, of course we got to jump into Walking in Memphis. It's such a game changer song. It's one of those songs, like I said, when I heard it on 
the top 40 countdown because mm. I like all kinds of music. My dad was an old 60s guy. He brought me up on the Four Tops and, wow. and the Beatles and Crosby, Stills and Nash. But we listened to that together and there'd be songs coming out of take I could, I could leave this song. But he said, this is a great song. Wow. So I started to listen to it. You kind of took James Taylor saying that sometimes when you have writer's block, you just got to go somewhere, right. which he did for his last album. I read, I read that he too. went away That's for right. like eight weeks away from his family. Like Cape just, Cod or something. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right. So I that he could he's be still, inspired. He's still doing it. Yeah. Exactly. But tell me about that 85 trip of, of taking that destination because it was kind of desperate times. You know? Yeah, I was, you know. I had wanted at that point, but by 85, how old was I? 25, maybe 24. I don't remember. And I was, uh, deeply aware that a lot of my heroes had already written their masterpieces by the time they were 19. Yeah. Brian Wilson wrote Pet Sounds at 23. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. <laughs> I know. I mean, Jackson Brown wrote these days when he was like 16. I know. It's like that. It's almost like, really? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's such a world weary. Gorgeous, right. poignant song. You were 16. I could play some of my songs when I was 16, but I wouldn't. If I seem to be afraid to live the life that I have made in song. And I had willed myself to be a singer-songwriter. I loved it. So, I loved those early records by James and Joni and Jackson and the band and Van Cat Morrison, Stevens. Cat Stevens. I mean, Crosby, Sills and Nash. The list is pretty long. And they were all records that I originally heard probably on Sunday morning radio in Cleveland. Right. And I was constantly as a little kid talking to the DJ, asking him, what's that? What's that? And then I'd go buy right. it. But I wanted to be a songwriter too. And by the time I was 24 or 25, I had some good songs, but not really, uh, not good enough. And I wasn't signed yet. So I knew if I was gonna be honest with myself, uh, I hadn't arrived. I hadn't found my songwriting voice. And I went to Memphis specifically to try to find it. And that's the oddest part of the story to me because my experience ever since then is whenever I go consciously looking for inspiration, I never, never find, find it. All right. Uh, but this time is different. I, I thought maybe, you know, at least I'll, I'll hear something that'll open up my sensibilities or I'll meet someone or I'll see something. And I it just never stopped from the minute I walked off the plane till I went home. Got a first class ticket, but I'm as blue as a boy can be. Those experience uh, had, had come was, together and you knew yeah, yeah. that it would resonate. Do you really feel the way I feel? And two in particular that resonated for me, that for me are the are the centerpiece of the song. One was going to hear Al Green preach the gospel, right? I know Jesus. You go there on a Sunday morning, I think he's still there occasionally uh, at his church called the Full Gospel Tabernacle. Um, one of my favorite soul singers of all time, but there he was preaching the gospel. And like you said at the beginning, you know, I'm a Jewish kid from Cleveland, um, but you, I wasn't quite sure in those moments if, if my people had it right. <laughs> I had goose flesh for four hours while this was happening and tears were running down oh, my, yeah. my eyes. And you know, I never used to cry in temple uh, only because I wanted to get the hell out. <laughs> not, right. uh, not because right. I was so moved, but that's what happened at Al Green's church. And uh, there's no articulating for you what that was like. I'm sure you've been there. If you haven't, you gotta well, go. Well, because you talked about three hours. I mean, this, I mean, of course, Al Green, the way he sings, just- It's amazing. And the amazing thing as a singer for me was three hours of, of really like singing. Intense. Intense. His voice got stronger and stronger, which is also the opposite of what usually happens. You know, after three hours of really hitting it, you start yeah. getting tired. Your voice can't take it. Not his. Oh, yeah. Um, so he There's had the spirit. baptism of fire. Man. Absolutely. So I did that. The river and green, be glad to see you. Which was way beyond what I ever could have thought it would be. And I, I just tried to soak it all in. When you haven't got a prayer. Then I met Muriel, who's real, was oh. a real person. Um, she passed away maybe six months before walking in Memphis hit the radio. Gosh. Um, so I guess that wasn't meant to be, but uh, 
we we immediately hit it off. She was playing in this little place called the Hollywood. Muriel plays piano every Friday at the Hollywood. Fried pickles and catfish everywhere. Nobody really listening to Muriel except me and maybe 20 other people. And uh, she was up there singing Glory of Love and His Eyes on the Sparrow and Touch the Hem of His Garment. And um, I fell in love with this woman, 65-year-old <laughs> school teacher from Helena, Arkansas. Right. This was her way of making a little extra money on the weekends. Gosh. And uh, she blew love. me away. And I, I went up to her during her breaks and I told her a little bit about my story that I was looking for inspiration. And she right. told me about her story. And I guess by the end of the night, 11 o'clock, 11.30, she, she invited me up to sing. And she started singing all these gospel songs as if I would know them. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but you I couldn't didn't. find a song you kind of both knew. Yeah, exactly. You know? Do a little number, and I sing with all my might. But she kind of whispered the lyrics in my ear of these old gospel songs. And I would try to catch up and catch on to the melody. They were kind of, I could, I could get the gist of it. Right. And then we did Amazing Grace. Oh, yeah. And uh, I, she didn't need to whisper in my ear the lyrics to that one. I knew that one. And man, that was just like another moment, like meeting Marilee Rush. There was something about it where when the song was done, I felt I had been transported. And then she whispered in my ear again and said, child, I think you can go and write those songs now. Walking in Memphis. I love the part that you tell about how you had told her about your mother yes. dying when, when you were two. Right. And, and that you were having a hard time letting that go. Or, she said, or, you can let it go now. You can let it go now. Yeah. That's amazing. It is amazing. To yeah. Spiritual awakening, as you said. Right. Are you a Christian child? And I said, ma'am, I am tonight. But what I love about it, because so many people misunderstand the song in some ways where, oh, yeah, the Elvis song. It's not Elvis is one little part of it talking about the jungle room and talking about Graceland. And, and the security part, I always thought <laughs> that maybe that was a little tip of the hat to the Springsteen when he was trying to climb the wall. Did oh, you ever hear about that? I did hear that story. Maybe, maybe that was subconsciously in there. Yeah, yeah. Just, just an accident. But yeah. remember, we tried to climb the wall I love to meet that. Springsteen. Yeah. Right, exactly. The ghost of Elvis on Union I remember hearing John Lennon say he didn't really want to talk too much about what his songs meant. Right. Because it didn't matter what they meant to him. Because it, it meant something different to everybody. Right. How does it resonate for you? Right. Down in the jungle room when I was walking in Memphis. But also W.C. Handy, the father of the blues. It's like you took pieces of, of American music, mm. not just rock and roll, but just all of that and right. put it together. Well, man, I, I like I said, when I left there, I knew I had a song. Um, and when I finally wrote it, uh, I knew I had a good song. Oh, yeah. And I hadn't written one of those maybe ever up to yeah. that point. I'd written a few songs that I liked, but I knew that that was the beginning of re me really finding my songwriting voice. And I was still four or five years away from being signed to Atlantic. So people asked me, did you know it was a hit? It was like I, I wasn't even thinking about hits. I was yeah. just trying to write my best songs. And that was a turning point for sure. Your demos that are on your newest album right. are out that give us a different feel and take of how that where that was going. I always read that you started trying to play it on guitar. And Memphis. Then you, yeah. Right, right. And then you started to move to the piano and you kind of have that first line. And there was five different versions, right? Oh, there's more than that. There's five on the, on yeah. the record, but yeah, yeah. I did it dozens of times. I mean, I drove every drummer and bass player in New York City <laughs> out of their freaking minds. And the blue suede shoes too, what I love about that is that was a little tip of the hat to Carl Perkins. Absolutely. Just, Big um, tip of the hat, yeah. Oh, there's been so many covers. Cher, of course, took it to the UK charts. Dutch down in the land of the Delta Blue. Paul Anka, I really dig his version. <laughs> I, I bet you that you got a kick out of that. I got a big kick out of that <laughs> version. It's unbelievable. But I'm as blue as a boy can be. And Tony Hadley, a Spandu a Ballet, also. Covered. Don't know that one. You'll have to listen to that one. And then, of course, Shut Up and Dance. I have a I big know. hit, borrowing from that. I'm raving, I'm raving. I'm I want to ask you, though, do you remember the first time that you heard it on the radio? Absolutely. Tell me about Absolutely. that moment. Absolutely. You know I do. <laughs> um, 
As an artist, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine. There must not be an artist alive who doesn't remember the I first know. time they heard themselves on the radio. I was driving uh, in Connecticut uh, to a house that I had bought specifically to try to write in. And because um, I was living in New York, but I was, I think I was driving to that house. What I remember very vividly is the DJ saying, this next song really, it really reminds me of this song from a long time ago by a guy that nobody remembers, but that I still love named Andy Pratt. Wow. Do you remember that name? Yeah. You do? Yeah. yeah. He had yeah. a song called Avenging Annie. That's or Andy, Avenging Andy, right? It's yeah. way out there. But it was a piano, he was a piano based songwriter. And then he also said, it reminds me a little of Lee Michaels too, right? Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I just saw her with my best friend. Do you know what I mean? And I immediately went, I think they're going to play me. Because those are weird those references. Are like, way I mean, out there. like, Whitney Houston is not coming on now. <laughs> no, <I can't. laughs> um, I love it. And it was. It was then he then the big that piano figure started and I had to pull over. I pulled over to the side of the road and I just sat there and I smiled from ear to ear <laughs> and I I cried a little bit and I thought about my mother and my father and my life having come to some remarkable crossroads. Wow. That was huge for me. Something about hearing yourself, even to this day, I, I mean, if I hear myself on the radio, it really moves me. Because I know I'm not the only one listening. That's hearing that. Yeah. I'm sharing yes. that with people I don't know. But that first time was unbelievable. In the middle of the pouring rain. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this Bottle Lightning Classic. What do you remember about this song? First time you heard it. Uh, the lyrics, what they mean to you, the situations. What are some other Bottle of Lightning songs you think that we should cover on this show? Let us know in the comments. Uh, make sure if you like our stuff, if you like our videos, we'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to, to subscribe. Click that big red button and all that good stuff. It's all about keeping the music alive, guys. It really is. Um, thank you so much. Till next time. Three chords. Yeah, that's right.